everyone, and welcome to our Princeton Review live stream for the AP English Literature Test. My name is Gina Donegan, and I'm going to be teaching you a lot of tips and tricks for how you can score more highly on this year's AP English Literature Test. If you have any questions as we go along, feel free to type those into the chat field. We have a small group tonight, so I'd be happy to answer any of your questions or take your comments. And um, we have a helpful moderator here named Marcy, who's gonna be passing your comments on to me. So uh, this is part three of a three-part series on the literature exam. So if you happen to miss our other sessions, they are posted on YouTube. So you could always review those later if you'd like to. In the first two sessions, we talked a lot about the differences between taking the AP test on paper and taking it on a computer. Some of you will be doing one or the other. Um, and we also talked about overall strategies for the essays. Um, and tonight we're going to continue that. And uh, we're going to talk more about the literary analysis essay. And we'll also look at strategies for multiple choice questions. But for those of you who might have missed the first two sessions, let me just bring you up to speed on what you need to know about taking the AP exam. First of all, we're talking about the AP English literature exam, not to be confused with the language exam, which is a different one. So you may be taking the test on one of three dates. You might be taking it on Wednesday, May 5th. If that's the case, then you'll be taking a traditional paper and pencil test. Uh, you'll bubble in your answers on a bubble sheet and then someone will score your bubble sheet with a computer and score your handwritten essays. That's the traditional test. That's the same as the AP exam that everyone took two years ago. But there are two other alternatives. Your school might be running the AP literature test on Tuesday, May 18th. If that's the case, then you could be taking a paper and pencil test, but you could also be taking a digital test, most likely at a, at a school computer. And then the alternative date is Tuesday, June 1st, most of these people will be taking the digital exam, but it's even possible you could take the paper and pencil test on this date as well. So lots of options this year. Your school has already decided when and how you'll be taking the AP. You just want to make sure that you know how you'll be taking the test. So find out from your English teacher, if you haven't already, uh, what date you'll be taking it and whether you're taking it in digital format. If you are taking it on digital format, I would suggest that you go back to our first live stream later on and just review some of the information I talked about at the beginning about the specifics of how to take the digital test. It's a little bit different from the paper test. Um, but for those of you who are joining me from the last session, welcome back. We're going to pick up where we left off with our discussion of the essays. So we talked about the poetry analysis essay, which is the first essay you're given. We also talked about the prose fiction analysis essay, which is the second one. Now we're gonna get more in depth into the third essay, which is the literary argument question or literary analysis. Now remember, just because these essays appear in a certain order on the test, it doesn't, need, it doesn't mean that you need to write them in that order. You can actually choose to write them in whatever order you want. And my suggestion is that you start with whichever essay seems easiest to you. So eventually though, you will need to write the literary argument question. And this one is rather different from the other two because in the other two essays, you're given the text, you're given a poem or you're given an excerpt from fiction. But here you will not be given a text. Here you will only be given a question to answer and you must use your own knowledge of literature to, to answer the question. So it's the one prompt that requires a little bit more outside knowledge. And we'll talk about how you can prepare for that. So in order to get a top score on the literary argument essay, which is, and by the way, a top score is a six, you have to do a few things. Number one, you have to re respond to the prompt question with a thesis. So as you probably know, a thesis is your own unique idea about a certain issue. And ideally that thesis should have a little bit of complexity to it um, and be the kind of thesis that you can obviously support. So in order to support your thesis, 
you have to use evidence from a specific work of literature. And of course, we're talking about a work of fiction, most likely, although it's possible you could use a play, um, but we're mostly talking about classic works of literature that most students in AP English literature would read. So you need to use that evidence, but also explain how your evidence supports the thesis. That's really important to not only provide some facts about the work of fiction, but tie them to the thesis. And of course, wherever possible, we want to make sure that we have appropriate grammar, punctuation, good vocabulary, sentences that make sense. You know, one of the things the grader is definitely looking at is your writing style. And if your writing style is a little bit sloppy, sometimes it um, means that the grader won't understand all of your ideas. So the two most important things you have to ask yourself when you're writing this essay is, what is my thesis and how can I prove it? And basically your whole essay needs to revolve around that. Now, as you might know, if you've done any practice at all, um, these prompts typically come with a long list of suggested works of fiction. So the College Board will give you a list of maybe 30 different books on the page. Keep in mind though, you don't have to use any of those. Those are only suggestions. In fact, you can use just about any work of literature to prove your point. But again, the guideline is it should be the kind of book that would be read in a high school AP English class. So chances are you've read a lot of books in your class already, so you probably have a good knowledge of several works. What I would suggest is that you have at least three works prepared very well. In other words, when I say very well, I mean, you know the entire plot, you read the entire book, you know who the characters are, you've thought about this. Now, if you can have more than three, that's even better, right? But I would say three is the minimum. And two of them should be things that you know really, really well, like to the point where you've maybe writ, uh, written um, a, an essay on this topic before. Um, you pretty much know these books inside out. And then you could think of the third one as kind of your backup, right? Maybe you're not as uh, up on that book, but you feel like you know it well enough to use it if you have to. And again, we're talking minimum. So if you can come up with four or five, that's even better. But I think everybody needs um, at least three. And so if you're thinking, well, how can I prepare for the AP English literature test? This would be a key way to prepare to make sure that you know your two primary and third secondary work really well. If necessary, reread the books. I know that seems like a lot, but if you haven't read these books for several months or even a year, it might be a good idea to actually reread parts just to make sure that you're really familiar with what was in there. And of course, we all know there are things like, you know, literary notes online that you can access. Sometimes that's uh, good enough to just kind of read a synopsis to remind yourself of what the plot elements were. And ideally, you should be reading from larger critical editions. The reason I say that is, you know how those serious editions of classic literature have long introductions? Well, sometimes those long introductions or um, notations can actually be really helpful when you're preparing your work because they give you some insights into the work that you might not have come up with on your own. And so the idea is to create a study guide for each one of these works so that you can easily review them right before the test. And of course, when I say right before the test, I mostly mean the night before. Remember, you're not allowed to use any notes while you're actually taking the AP exam. So if you're creating a study guide, what are the kinds of things you should write down? Well, obviously a plot summary. You need to know what happened at the beginning, what happened in the middle, what happened at the end. Also, characters. It's really kind of awkward if you're trying to write about a book and you can't remember the characters' names. You know, that's just kind of embarrassing and it makes your essay a little more awkward. Now, I know some books have a lot of characters in them. You really just need to know the major characters 
Um, you know, you don't need to know necessarily every character that appeared, especially if it's something like a Charles Dickens novel where you might have 15 characters. That's not realistic. But you definitely need to know the names of the major characters. And so in some cases, you might refer to someone as, you know, John's cousin. Even if you can't remember John's cousin's name, at least you know John's name. Also think about themes. Many classic works of literature have multiple themes. So it's always good to have multiple themes because that means you might be able to apply the book to multiple types of question prompts. Remember, you don't know what they're gonna ask you, but the idea is if you know at least three books really well, then between all of those works, you're gonna find something that applies to the essay prompt. Another cool thing to write down is symbols. You know, some books have really obvious symbols like, you know, in Moby Dick, I suppose it was the whale. Or um, in other books, you know, there, there are symbols that are really a big part of the story. It's helpful if you're aware of those things. And again, they might help you with whatever the prompt is asking for. Now, when it comes to quotations, I'll leave it up to you. You can write a perfectly good essay without any quotations, but if you happen to know, say, one or two important ones, that can be a really good feature, a really good thing to add into your essay. I would say this is optional, but if you can think of any quotes and perhaps even memorize them, that's awesome. Um, and of course, a lot of books have famous quotes, so those might be the easiest ones to remember. So these are all things that you should do between now and test day. And just looking at the calendar, uh, you have, oh, about two weeks, right? Not a lot of time, but it's definitely enough time to create these little study guides for each one of your major works. Now, um, when you actually go to answer the question, let's say you can't think of anything you can use from your major works. Well, at that point, um, review the list of books that are written on the page. Remember, those books are only suggestions but sometimes just reading through that list might jog your memory. You might think of some other book that wasn't one of your planned works, but it may still be a, a book that works really well for the prompt. So don't panic. If you've taken AP English literature, you've read a lot of things. And so there's something in all of what you've read that might be relevant. Just be patient and do a little thinking before you start writing your essay. A good rule of thumb is that you should spend about five minutes um, reading the prompt carefully and thinking of the major pieces of evidence you're going to use based on whatever uh, book you're going to use. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at an example of a literary argument question prompt. And we're also going to look at an example of a really good essay that was written on this topic. So you can get a sense of what a high scoring essay sounds like. They'll often start you off with a quote such as this one. In his 2004 novel, Magic Seeds, V.S. Naipaul writes, it is wrong to have an ideal view of the world. That's where the mischief starts. That's where everything starts unraveling. And then here's the question, and we need to read the question carefully. Either from your own reading or from the list below, Choose a work of fiction in which a character holds an ideal view of the world. Then, in a well-written essay, analyze how the author's portrayal of this idealism, or I'm sorry, it should have said how the author portrays this idealism and its positive or negative consequences, and how that contributes to an interpretation of the work as a whole. So it's really important to read their directions. You might even want to read them twice just to make sure you picked up on everything that they're asking for. So in this case, we need a character who holds an ideal view of the world. We need to show that it had either positive or negative consequences. And we need to somehow relate this to the larger interpretation of the work as a whole. Now, remember, your job is to write a thesis statement. As a matter of fact, in in the first live stream, I suggested that you always put your thesis in the first paragraph. So you can't just write a thesis saying um, people hold ideal views of the world and sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. 
that's a boring thesis, okay? Your thesis has to be a little more specific. And usually what people do is they either agree or disagree with the concept. So in other words, a good thesis might say, having an ideal of the view, an ideal view of the world is actually a mostly positive thing because it blank, blank, blank. And then you explain why you believe that. Or you might go in the other direction. You might say, um, having an ideal view of the world generally has negative consequences for some reason. Now, in theory, you could also play as a more middle of the road approach. Like, you know, um, it can be positive or negative, but if you're gonna do that, I would try to clearly explain when it's positive and when it's negative, because that's gonna make your thesis a lot stronger. Remember, you earn one point for having a clear thesis, and then you earn additional points for supporting that thesis. So if you don't have a clear thesis, you not only lose the thesis point, but you might even lose some of the other points because it won't be clear what idea you're supporting. And then the most important thing is do not merely summarize the plot. So we're not looking for a book report based on um, the catcher in the rye, right? That's not the purpose here. We have to answer the question. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you an essay that actually got a perfect score of a six. This is a really good literary analysis essay. And we're gonna look and see how the author presented the thesis, how the author presented the evidence. And there's one more little thing we wanna read for, which is sophistication. Uh, there's one point given for what the College Board calls sophistication. And sometimes this comes down to a really interesting and complex thesis. Sometimes it has to do with writing style. And sometimes it has to do with finding things in the book that the average person might not necessarily find or think of. So let's see if we can figure out why this person got a perfect six. It says, oftentimes when coming from a well-off upbringing, an individual develops an idealistic viewpoint of the world. So right off the bat, we have the topic, which is being idealistic. And now we're going to get a definition of that. He or she may believe humans to be innately good or government to be innately focused on the well-being of all. So I like how this person defines the key term. They talked about idealism. You want to show the greater that you understand what idealism is. I think it's fair to say that you'll be defining at least one key term for every literary analysis essay, because there's always that core idea that they're asking you to address. And you want to make sure that it's clear to the grader how you're interpreting that key idea, in this case, idealism. Now we have the literary work. In his novel, Lord of the Flies, author William Golding presents readers with one such individual whose view of the world is too ideal to be true, a young British boy named Ralph. Now, if you've never read Lord of the Flies, this may not make a whole lot of sense so far, but if this author does a good job of re writing this essay, we'll actually have a really good idea of what Lord of the Flies is about by the end of this essay. So here we have a summary of who Ralph is. When an airplane crashes, leaving a group of boys stranded on an island, Ralph believes that he can bring, help bring the boys rescue, as long as the others cooperate. He soon finds out, however, that his plan is too optimistic. Through his character, Ralph, Golding conveys that in holding an idealistic view of the world is dangerous. While temporary success can be achieved, it ultimately leads to the destruction of governmental institutions and chaos. He encourages readers to adopt a more realistic view of the world and recognize the inherent evil in all people. So there you have the thesis. A lot of people will try to express the thesis in just one sentence. That's the most common thing to do. This person uses two sentences, and that's perfectly fine. And notice it's a very strong thesis. We know what the point is here, which is that an idealistic view of the world is dangerous. And the author is tying it to the larger themes of Lord of the Flies, right? So it's not just the author's opinion, and it's not even just about Ralph. It's about the author of the book conveying this meaning throughout the whole text which is really what they asked you for at the end of the directions. So there's the first paragraph, which is the introduction. We introduce the concept of idealism, which is the key term. We define the key term. We provide a very brief overview of what the book is about. 
and we introduce the character of Ralph. And then finally we get the thesis. So the next few paragraphs should be body paragraphs. So this is where the author is going to present us with evidence to try to prove that thesis. Let's check out the evidence. From the start, Ralph believes that he can create a direct democracy on the island that can ultimately bring the boys to safety. Shortly after the plane crash, Ralph and his friend Piggy find a conch shell on the beach. And Ralph, calling the, together the group, designates the conch shell as possessing special power. In particular, whoever holds the conch may speak, whoever does cannot. It is this, then, that becomes a symbol of democracy. So what do we have so far? We have a summary of something that happened in the book, and it's a very detailed summary, right? This is why I want you to prepare your study guides, because the more detailed you can get, the better. And the author is also touching on literary devices, like the conch shell is a symbol of democracy. And, you know, I don't know, would everyone think it's a symbol of democracy? It's hard to say, but I believe it based on what this author said. So. Wherever possible, you want to try to delve into literary devices in your essay. At first, Ralph's plan seems to work. Using the conch shell to assert his leadership, he instructs the group to build a signal fire on the island so that passing ships can see it and come rescue the boys. Ralph, moreover, instructs the kids to build huts, collect water for the group, and lays out a number of ground rules concerning urinating and other matters. Ralph's belief in his plan is based on his ideal view of the world. So notice we're tying it back to the major concept here, which is an idealistic character. Specifically, he believes that the boys, being good rational beings, will follow the rules and help maintain the signal fire. Ralph also assumes that his democracy is somehow perfect and that all its members will cooperate. Now you'll notice that in paragraph two, we haven't gotten too deeply into the thesis yet. So far, we just have a really detailed account of who Ralph is, what he does. We know there's a symbol of democracy um, and we know Ralph is an idealist. The part we need is the interpretation of the, pro of the thesis because the thesis said having an idealistic view is dangerous, right? So hopefully the next paragraph will give us that. As the novel progresses, however, Ralph begins to understand that his plan building on, built on idealistic assumptions will not hold up. Okay, so his plan's not working, it's starting to turn negative. Specifically, the boys quickly stop constructing the houses until it is only Ralph and Simon doing the work. The same carelessness is seen with the signal fire. When a ship passes, Ralph is enraged that the signal fire is out and that the boys are not rescued. Thus, the negative consequences, so there's a nod to the prompt, of having an ideal view of the world are begin to become clear. The boys not only miss out on the rescue opportunity, but do not even have homes to sleep in at night. Moreover, the democracy that Ralph creates begins crashing as well. At one point while Ralph is speaking, another boy named Jack interrupts him and refuses to stop talking. As seen later on, other boys also complain. Okay, so so far what we have is some indication of negative consequences. And we're probably going to get more of that. It is only near the end of the novel when the worst consequences of Ralph's naivety, so there you go, idealism and negative consequences, are in broad display. At, the, at this point, Ralph has virtually lost all of his boys who instead run to Jack. Okay, so there's a lot of detail here. We don't even necessarily need to read all this detail, but we can see that the author is convincing us that there were bad consequences of Ralph's idealism. Um, and then um, it later on in this paragraph, it talks about the dissolution of Ralph's democracy. And how about this sentence? Literally and symbolically, evil triumphs over good by the novel's end and Ralph's optimistic hopes become a bitter reality. So that's a really obvious reference to the thesis. That's a good thing. Um, you might sometimes feel like you're over explaining things, but to the greater, it's actually gonna feel like just enough explanation. So it's always better to kind of over explain a little bit. And here's our conclusion. In William Golding's Lord of the Flies, an optimistic ideal view of the world is exposed by Ralph, who believes a direct democracy and cooperation can bring the boys off the island. When the boys gradually turn away from Ralph and towards Jack, destroying democracy and killing people in the process, 
the reader comes to understand the negative side of Ralph's optimism. Ralph's ideal view of the world makes his plan extremely precarious and is bound to fail from the beginning. The end result is nothing but violence, destruction of his government, and chaos. Golding therefore urges readers to accept the faults of humanity and the fact that no person or institution is perfect. In doing so, they can begin to create governments that stand strong and plans that work well. So I like those last two sentences because what the author is doing here is referring to the second part of his thesis, which was that Golding is trying to get people to accept that you know, idealism isn't the way to go. So this is an example of a great essay. Again, this essay got a six. Notice it's fairly long. It's five paragraphs. So it has an introduction, it has a conclusion and three fairly solid body paragraphs. It has a lot of plot summary, but it's not just plot summary, right? It's constantly referring to the thesis and it's constantly explaining how the evidence supports that thesis. So if you can write an essay like this, you'll get a six. Now, that then there's that little sophistication point, right? This person would definitely get the sophistication point. And one of the reasons is because the level of vocabulary in this essay is very good. You know, we have words like um, sadistic and demonizes and um, varied vocabulary, right? The author's not using the same words over and over again, but is using different ways of saying the same thing. As a matter of fact, the conclusion is mostly just a rehash of what was in the rest of the essay, but it feels sort of fresh, right? It doesn't feel like the author's just recycling the same words and sentences. So um, keep in mind, it's a little tough to do this in 40 minutes, right? Um, you don't necessarily have to be this fancy to get a six, but this is an example of what some people can do in 40 minutes. So, um, you know, the more you try to mimic this style, the better. And Lord of the Flies was a great choice because it's a fairly simple novel, but it has really deep themes. And it's also a book that almost everyone has at least heard of, even if you hadn't, haven't read it. And the AP graders will definitely have heard of Lord of the Flies and many of them will have read it. Remember that these essays tend to get sorted into categories or piles based on which graders have experience with which books. So your grader will definitely know this book inside out. And that's part of the reason why we wanna use a lot of detail so that we can impress that grader. So again, if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about so far, feel free to type your questions into the chat. And so at this point, um, we have now talked about all of the types of essays. In session two, we focused on the poetry analysis and the prose fiction analysis. Now we've talked about the literary argument essay. I would like to spend some time on the multiple choice questions because as you probably know, the multiple choice questions are going to account for almost half of your AP score. So it's definitely an important part of the test. Time management is really crucial in this section because you're gonna have anywhere from 50 to 55 questions to answer in 60 minutes. That's not a lot of time. Now, keep in mind, you don't necessarily need to get through every single question to get a five. You can actually leave a few un, unattempted and still get a five, assuming that you're really accurate on the ones that you answered. But Obviously we have to get through most of the section, right? If we only get through half the section in 60 minutes, we're not gonna get a five. So um, always watch the clock. Number two, process of elimination is the way to get the best answer. The best answer is not always going to jump out at you. You really have to get there more by eliminating the ones that you know are wrong. And you often get yourself down to two choices that look really close. So then your decision becomes, which one is really the better answer? And even though you don't need to get through all of the questions, you do need to answer all the questions. You should never leave anything blank. And that's simply because your score is determined by the number of right answers. You don't lose points for wrong answers. So if you do happen to run out of time, just make sure you pick some 
random guesses on the other questions so that you don't run the risk of leaving any points on the table. Sometimes random guessing can actually earn you, you know, one or two more points. And I also want to stress here that if you're taking the digital exam, you are required to answer all the questions in order. That's one of the things we talked about in our first session. So always keep an eye on the time. Note the number of passages that you're given. So what you could do is kind of take a look at all the passages up front and do a little quick division in your head. Like, okay, I have 60 minutes and I have six passages. So that means I have about 10 minutes per passage, something like that. I don't want you to time yourself per question. That's going to be maddening, but it would be a good idea to just keep an eye on the clock for every group of questions, every passage. Remember, you're going to have poetry and you're going to have prose fiction. It's going to be a mix of the two in the multiple choice section. If you are taking a paper and pencil test, then you do have the freedom to choose the passages in whatever order you want. So it might be a good idea to skim through and decide which one looks the easiest. Like for example, they might give you a nice short poem. Sometimes those are easy because you don't have to read a lot. Or they might give you a prose fiction text that actually comes from a book you've read. That might be an easy one to start with too. And at the same time, I'd like you to look at the passages and decide which one you think might be the hardest. Whichever one you think might be the hardest, leave it for last. So that way, if you're running out of time, you're running out of time on questions that you might have missed anyway, not on questions that should have been easier. Now, remember, this only applies to people taking the paper and pencil test. If you're taking the digital exam, you won't have the freedom to skip around, unfortunately. But that just means that you'll want to keep an eye on the clock to get through most of it. Once you've chosen a passage to work on, work the passage. That just means reading it, but also trying to understand it as you go along. And then answer the questions. And we're going to talk about some of the good strategies you can use for answering the questions. Now, let's say you completely run out of time. And let's say you have five questions left. Don't leave them blank. But it's also not a good idea to just kind of randomly choose, you know, A, B, C, D or something. What I would suggest you do is use the same letter guess for all of your random guesses. We like to call this letter of the day. Now, there is no magic letter. If there was, I would certainly tell you what it is. But just choose the same letter for all your guesses. That way, statistically, it's more likely that you're going to score some points by doing that. Because if you choose A, you know, seven times, chances are at least one or two of those are going to be A. So um, most tests have five passages. And you'll have a mix of prose fiction and poetry. So it might be, say, two prose fiction passages and three poems or something like that. And it's usually around 55 questions to answer in an hour, sometimes a little fewer than that. So one thing you might want to try is before you actually read the passage, take just a brief minute to preview the questions. Now, when I say the questions, I don't mean the answers. You're just going to read through all the questions to get a feel for what they're asking you for. Because sometimes that's a good way to direct your reading, to make sure that you're reading for the right things. And sometimes this can be a time saver. As you're reading, identify the main point of each paragraph, or if it's a poem, the main point of each stanza. Ask questions of the text. You know, we call this active reading because we really want to try to understand things as we go along. It wouldn't be good if we had to go back and read the whole thing again, right? So um, try to figure things out as you go along. And then once you're done reading the prose fiction piece or the poem, ask yourself, what is the main idea of the whole thing? Because many of the questions will revolve around that main idea. And especially with a poem, we know poems can be tough, right? Sometimes it's hard to figure out the exact meaning. But you have to have at least a, a good sense of what it might be. Because again, a lot of the questions will revolve around that. 
If you've read a poem and you're completely lost, my suggestion is read it again, because typically it's not going to take long to read it again. And the second time you read it, you're going to pick up on things that you might not have seen the first time. Now, when it comes to process of elimination, there are a few types of wrong answers that show up a lot in the multiple choice questions. First of all, we have answers that are mostly true, but there might be one word or phrase that makes the answer wrong. So you have to read the answer carefully, right? Read every word of every answer to make sure you're not missing anything. Number two, we have completely wrong answers. These are things that go completely against the main idea of the fiction piece or the poem. So this is why it's un it's really important to understand the main idea. Um, sometimes we have things that are, seem like they could be right, but the question is, are they the best answer to the question? So if in doubt, always go back and reread the question. And then finally, sometimes we have answers that say things that we're just not in the text or not in the poem. These are trap answers if you're kind of making things up in your head. So make sure you have some specific proof from the text before you choose an answer. Let's take a look at an example of an excerpt from a prose fiction passage. Prose fiction passages are going to be longer than what I have here but I've just given us a little excerpt and a question just to illustrate how you want to be careful with your process of elimination. So let's read this one together. It says, early in the morning, late in the century, Cricklewood Broadway. At 0627 hours on January 1st, 1975, Alfred Archibald Jones was dressed in corduroy and sat in a fume-filled Cavalier Musketeer estate face down on the steering wheel hoping the judgment would not be too heavy upon him. He lay in a prostrate cross, jaw slack, arms splayed on either side, like some fallen angel. Scrunched up in each fist, he held his army service medals and his marriage license, for he had decided to take his mistakes with him. Okay, that's slightly funny. A little green light flashed in his eye, signaling a right turn he had resolved never to make. He was resigned to it. He was prepared for it. He had flipped a coin and stood staunchly by the results. This was a decided upon suicide. In fact, it was a New Year's resolution. Okay, so it's very dark, right? We're reading about somebody who's about to commit suicide. It's written in a slightly humorous fashion, but you know, maybe we won't go so far as to say this is comedy, right? Um, so let's take a look at the question. The question says lines three through 16 of the passage. Now, that's most of what we read, right? So starting here at Alfred Archibald Jones and going all the way to, you know, signaling a right turn. <clears throat> lines three through 13 of the passage best describe the author's portrayal of Alfred Archibald Jones as. So remember, what we're trying to find is things that might be wrong with our answers. We're not really looking for a reason to pick it. We're looking for a reason to cross it out. So answer A, a harshly condemnatory treatment of a coward. That sounds really strong, doesn't it? If an answer sounds very strong, very extreme, it's probably wrong. Because first of all, the tone of this, if anything, seems slightly funny. I mean, hard to say, but it certainly doesn't seem like we're condemning this guy. Um, and to say that he's a coward, that would be adding something to the text that's not there. So it's definitely not A, too strong. How about a sympathetic portrayal of a man who regrets his life? Well, they did talk about his army service medals and his marriage license. He had decided to take his mistakes with him. So he does have regrets. Is it a sympathetic portrayal? Well, Maybe, right? That's the kind of answer I'd keep on the first pass. Is it a farcical portrayal of an attempted suicide? Maybe a little bit farcical, so let's keep that one. Is it a mock heroic portrait of a vintage car enthusiast? Well, first of all, is he a vintage car enthusiast? I don't think we really know that, right? So this would be an example of an answer that's introducing something 
irrelevant or simply unstated? And could it be a darkly ironic treatment of an overly sensitive man? Well, we did pick up on a little bit of irony here, I suppose. Um, but the question is, is he overly sensitive? Now, that would be a judgment that we would be making as a reader. But if you can't find proof for that in the text, that's probably kind of like answer A. It's a little too negative. So the two answers that might look close here are uh, B or C. A sympathetic portrayal of a man who regrets his life, a farcical portrayal of an attempted suicide. Those are really close choices. If you're on the fence, I always say it's uh, maybe a little better to go with something that seems safe. Um, answer B says that the author is sympathetic. Well, if we scan through our passage, let's see if we can find any sympathy. The beginning of the passage is really kind of cold in the way it's written, right? He's dressed in corduroy, he's sitting in the car, he's hoping the judgment would not be too heavy. He lay in a prostrate cross. So, so far we just have a description of what he looks like. We know that this guy has regrets. We know he's trying to commit suicide. I guess the question is, is the author showing any sympathy? I don't really see any sympathy here, right? I mean, if anything, the author is describing him in a slightly funny way. So I think answer C is our better choice because it is a little bit farcical and we know there is an attempted suicide going on. So that's how your process of elimination should work with multiple choice questions. Don't think that you're just gonna find the right answer right away. Usually it's a matter of eliminating the ones you know are the worst and then working your way from there. So now what we're gonna do is take a look at an example of multiple choice questions attached to a poem. And some of the same strategies that we talked about for the poetry analysis essay might apply here. For example, it's always good to try to read the poem as prose. What I mean by that is try not to get too caught up in the rhyme scheme or the meter. They might ask you those things, but the first time you read the, pass the poem, you really just need to get the main idea and reading it as though it's prose might actually help you to do that. When you're answering the questions, always use process of elimination, that's POE. And also try to pick answers that are consistent with each other. What I mean by that is whatever the main idea is, it's going to pop up in a lot of the correct answers. So make sure you're not picking answers that seem to contradict each other as far as the main idea. And if they ever give you a line reference, which they will sometimes, be sure to read before and after it. Don't just read the lines themselves. You always need the full context. So when you get a poem, always read the title because sometimes the title is really helpful in understanding what the poem is about. So this one is called On a Drop of Dew, written by Andrew Marvel. If you've heard of Andrew Marvel, you know this is a very old poem. So it's written at a time when big themes were important. Things like love, death, God, those were the themes that were really important at the time he was writing this. But even if you haven't heard of Andrew Marvel, you'll be able to tell from the language that this is an old poem. So let's read through it and just see if we can pick up on the main idea. Always make note of footnotes because sometimes they're actually going to define some archaic words for you, which is really helpful. So it starts with see how the Orient do. Now, if we check the sub or the uh, footnote here, it says pearly or sparkling. So see how the sparkling dew shed from the bosom of the morn into the blowing roses, which according to the footnote is blooming roses. Okay, so let's try that again. See how the sparkling dew shed from the bosom of the morn into the blooming roses, yet careless of its mansion new, for the clear region where twas born round in itself encloses. Okay, that's kind of a mouthful, but remember we know this is about a drop of dew. So it's in the roses, but it's careless 
of its mansion. Now, what's a mansion? Well, it's a place you live, right? So the drop of dew is careless about being in the roses. For the clear region where twas born, now where is a drop of dew born? Uh, I don't know, but maybe we'll find out. Round in itself encloses. And in its little globe's extent, frames as it can its native element. How it the purple flower does slight, so that's interesting, it's slighting the flower for some reason, scarce touching where it lies, but gazing back upon the skies shines with a mournful light like its own tear. So the author's saying that a drop of dew has its own tear. That's kind of interesting. Because so long divided from the sphere, restless it rolls and unsecure. Now, the spherical reference happens a few times, right? Because we know that the drop of dew is round. It's a globe but it's been divided from the sphere. So in other words, if we think of maybe a larger drop or some body of water, the drop of dew has been divided from that. And according to line 15, it is restless and unsecure, trembling lest it grow impure till the warm sun pity its pain and to the skies exhale it back again. Always look for repeated words. Skies was mentioned in line 11. The drop of dew is gazing back upon the skies. And now the author says that it's, um, it's restless, it's unsecure, and it wants to go back to the skies. So the soul that drop, that ray of the clear fountain of eternal day. So what is the author doing here? The author is now likening the drop of dew to a soul. So the soul, that ray of the clear fountain of eternal day, could it within the human flower be seen? So we're talking about the human soul. Remembering still its former height, shuns the sweet leaves and blossoms green, and recollecting its own light, does in its pure and circling thoughts express the greater heaven in a heaven less. In how coy a figure wound, every way it turns away, so the world excluding round, yet receiving in the day. Dark beneath, but bright above, here disdaining, there in love. How loose and easy hence to go, how girt and ready to ascend. Now that should remind you of something, because remember the dew drop was looking to the skies and wanting to go back to the sky. Now we're talking about the soul, and according to this, the soul is ready to ascend. Moving but on a point below, it all about does upwards bend. There again, ready to ascend and a reference to the skies. Such did the manna's sacred dew distill, white and entire, though congealed and chill. Congealed on earth, but does dissolving run into the glories of the almighty sun. So there's another reference to the sun. Now, I know poems can be tough, but one of the things you always want to look for is repeated elements or repeated themes. Here, one of the things that repeats a lot is obviously the drop of dew, but also the skies, right? The, the little dew drop is looking to the skies. It's divided from the sphere. It's restless. It's unsecure. It wants to go back to the skies. And according to this, the sun will bring it back. Then we shift over to the soul. So the poet must be saying that the human soul is like the drop of dew. It wants to, quote, go back to the skies. Now, what would the skies be? Well, according to line 28, it's heaven. So it's definitely a spiritual poem, right? And remember, a lot of the poets of this time wrote about things that were spiritual in nature. So let's take a look at the kind of question that they might ask you. There are basically two types of questions, general questions and specific questions. This is an example of a general question. The overall content of the poem can best be described by which statement. Now, let's say you weren't reading this with me and you really didn't get the meaning. Well, my advice before was read it one more time. But let's say you're still a little iffy on the meaning. 
do the more specific detail questions first, leave this kind of question for last, because it might make more sense once you attempt some of those more specific questions. But let's take a look at our options here. And again, POE, process of elimination. The characteristics of a drop of dew are related to those of the human soul. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward because we have the drop of dew, we have the human soul, there seems to be a relationship there. So let's keep this answer. How about B? The life cycle of a drop of dew is contemplated. It's not a bad answer, but what's missing? What's missing is the whole second half of the poem. Because the second half of the poem actually wasn't so much about the drop of dew, it was about the human soul. So this answer is just kind of incomplete. How about answer C? The human soul is shown to be a drop of dew. Well, this is a good trap if you know that there's a connection between the drop of dew and the human soul. But the problem with this answer is it's taking it all a little too literally, okay? My soul is not actually a drop of dew, right? It might be like a drop of dew. The drop of dew may be a metaphor, but that's not the same as saying that the soul literally is a drop of dew. How about D? The physical characteristics of a drop of dew are analyzed. Well, that's kind of like answer B. It was in there, but it's not what the overall content of the poem is. It's leaving out important things about the human soul. And then how about E? The poet offers a mystical vision of a drop of dew as a spiritual entity that has all the qualities of the human soul. Well, that one seems kind of close to answer A, but notice how answer A is a little more straightforward. Like, okay, the characteristics of the drop of dew are related to the soul. Answer E is trying to add in some specifics that we can't necessarily prove. Like, okay, is this really mystical? Um, I don't know. It depends on how you think about it. Is the drop of dew actually a spiritual entity? Mm, that's a little iffy. It It is in the poet's imagination, right? But is it actually a spiritual entity? And does it have all the qualities of the human soul? See, I don't like the word all there because that falls into the category of an answer that's just a little too extreme to be provable. So answer A is better. The best answer should feel pretty straightforward. It might even feel rather obvious. That's a good thing. If you have an answer that seems obvious, it means you have the best answer. So we don't have time to try all the questions for this poem, but that just gives you an idea of how you should break down poetry when you're in the multiple choice section. And let me just take a minute to tell you a little bit more about how the Princeton Review can help you with your AP prep. The best option for you at this point might be some one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We have AP tutors available, even on a tight schedule. You only have about two weeks, but chances are we can find a tutor who can accommodate your schedule. The tutor can give you feedback on your essays, can help you prep those works of literature. So this is a really good option if you feel like you need some fast help. And if you're interested in this, I would definitely encourage you to call 802 review sometime tomorrow or whenever you have a convenient time to do it, or go to princetonreview.com and you can get more information there. And if you're really under the gun and you don't have much time to prep, at the very least, you really should get a copy of Cracking the AP English Literature Exam. You can find this book at any major bookstore. It's gonna give you a good overview of the test. It's gonna give you practice tests, and it's give, gonna give you more ideas on how to prep your study guides for literature. So thank you so much for joining me today. And since this, this is our last live stream for this subject, I wish you the best of luck on your AP literature test and have a great summer. Have a good night, everyone.